this is James McGuire. I'm a senior physician in the Division of Infectious Disease and Department of Medicine at the Brigham Women's Hospital and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'll be talking about tropical medicine and parasitology. I have no disclosures to make. Before I get started on the talk, I'd like to say a few things about COVID-19 and is this in fact a tropical disease? Initially, when we heard about COVID, we were lulled into the belief that warmer temperatures and higher humidity may decrease the efficiency of transmission, but certainly the events in recent weeks have shown that tropical countries are being hit very hard with, with, the, uh, with the virus. I'll think of what's going on in, in Brazil and India right now. Um, this is particularly problematic for people living and working in these countries where we have tremendous poverty, limited resources, and already overstretched healthcare systems. Um, we also have other tropical diseases. And so managing patients with COVID-19, making the diagnosis, uh, we have to rule out the other multiple causes of infectious disease syndromes. Um, there are episodes already ongoing of co-epidemics. And so there's episodes of dengue striking an area where COVID is striking as well, which complicates complicates matters tremendously. We're also learning a little bit about co-infections of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. It's also made big differences for travel and tropical diseases. And so one thing we've seen is a great fall in, in imported tropical diseases since people aren't, aren't traveling and also concern about people who want to travel overseas. And there's concern about being infected on airplanes. Um, airliners are safe in many regards. There's exchange of air, there's filtration of air, but people can be, can be infected with, with respiratory viruses on, on airliners. Uh, crowded airports are, are a risk, and there's always the risk of being stranded in a country and being unable to, to return. So COVID-19 will be important um, whenever we think about travel-related illnesses and tropical diseases. What I'd like to talk about for the rest of the session are, are different illnesses, tropical diseases and parasitic diseases, and do that in the context of febrile illnesses, diarrhea, important infections of immigrants and returning long-term expatriates and patients with skin lesions. And we'll do this by presenting short clinical vignettes and uh, give you a chance to think about answers and, and uh, propose uh, solutions. So here's our first case. This was a 40-year-old man with fever and mental status changes we saw a few years ago. He'd been in Nigeria for three weeks and came back 10 days earlier. Over the past week, he felt a little bit off, malaise, had a little bit of feverishness, but he was going to work. But he comes home one night, and at the dinner table, he begins to behave un 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 unnaturally. He goes to bed early, and the next morning, um, his family finds him um, agitated and unable to follow commands, and he has a fever. He's brought to the emergency room, where he has a temperature of 102 degrees Fahrenheit, and, and he's confused. His hematocrit is 32, his white count is 6,000, Platelets are 110,000, and creatinine is elevated over his normal um, his normal baseline. The creatinine is 2.2. So at this point, we have this gentleman returning from Nigeria with fever, confusion, and acute kidney injury. What do you think might be going on? So just take a second and and think about a quick differential diagnosis. So here's some information on returning travelers with fever. Um, this has been collected by the GeoSentinel network, which is a network of travel clinics that gathers data on returning travelers from all over the world. They're based in North America and Europe, Japan, and, and, and elsewhere. One of the most common reasons for presentation to one of these specialized clinics is fever. And of people with fever, malaria was the number one cause of presentation. Again, these are specialized clinics, so this may not be what we see in general practice. Um, other common causes of fever were viral syndromes, dengue, and in recent years, we've also seen chikungunya and Zika. Mononucleosis syndromes for people who've been sexually active um, or contact with young children with Epstein-Barr or, or uh, cytomegalovirus or HIV. Recretial disease, um, which is African tick bite fever for, for many of the travelers, enteric fever, which is typhoid. Um, some people who have diarrheal illnesses or respiratory illnesses present with, with undifferentiated fever, and we see this with COVID-19, and so we want to think about that. Uh, acute hepatitis, acute HIV are things to, to think about. 
So getting back to our patient, um, he was an immigrant from Nigeria, had been living in the States for six years. And before he went back to, to Nigeria, um, he didn't see his physician. He was taking no anti-malarial chemoprophylactic agents and he hadn't received travel vaccines. The reason for travel was to visit family and friends. So at this point, what further studies would you get? We've, we've got the basic blood work, uh, other, other things you might wanna get. And I'm sure many of you are thinking, let's get a blood smear. So here is our blood smear showing red cells with a fairly high percentage of intracellular parasites. And this is Plasmodium falciparum, and actually a high parasitemia, it was about 8%. Also confirmed the diagnosis of falciparum malaria with a rapid blood test for malaria. This is a, a point of care test where the drop of blood will give you diagnosis of malaria or not malaria, and then falciparum or other species. Now, a couple of things about this case that I think are very important. Um, in the United States, um, in recent years, we've seen thousands of cases of imported malaria, and, and cases are going up. So over 2,000 cases for the, the last year that CDC has presented data um, in 2016. This is despite the fact that the incidence of malaria is falling worldwide, but I think what we're, we're seeing the rise in cases is because of increase in travel, and particularly uh, patients like our patient who's reason for travel was to go home and visit friends and relatives. And so in the CDC sur survey, for those for whom they have the information, almost three quarters of people who had malaria, uh, were the, the reason for travel was to visit friends and relatives. Now, one thing's interesting, looking at this year's number of cases compared to the same time last year, um, we're less than a third of the number of imported cases, and this reflects the, the, the COVID um, outbreak. Now, the other point about this patient is here's a patient who was going to work um, and performing fairly normally until the day before he's brought to the hospital and then gets very sick overnight. He's got cerebral malaria, he's got renal insufficiency and a high parasitemia. And the reason that falciparum malaria is the cause of life-threatening illness in patients with, with malaria is easily seen on this, on this slide. Um, we look at the smear, large numbers of, paras of, of red cells are parasitized, and that's because the parasite can infect red cells of all ages, small ones that are old, large ones that are young. Um, secondly, the only stage that we see on the smear are the ring slide, uh, the rings. The, the ring stages. And the reason for that is that the parasite presents antigens on the red cell membrane as it matures. These antigens make the red cell sticky. It allows the, the parasitized red cell to adhere to the endothelium of small blood vessels. So down here, uh, we, we see small blood vessels in the brain of this case of, of fatal cerebral malaria. They're just jam-packed with parasitized red cells. So we're blocking the flow of blood. So falcip is life-threatening because it causes high parasitemia. Um, it causes this stickiness and blocking of small blood vessels. Um, large numbers of red cells are, are destroyed by the parasite, so severe anemia, um, lack of delivery of oxygen and nutrients to, to critical uh, organ systems. And then on top of that, massive production of cytokines, both systemic and, and locally, so things such as tumor, no, tumor necrosis factor that make the patients very, very ill. So falciparum malaria um, progresses rapidly, is life-threatening, particularly people who don't have acquired immunity, which is usually people who've grown up in endemic areas. And then in, on top of that, um, it can mimic other infections. And so these are some of the complications of severe falciparum malaria. Cerebral malaria can present with coma. And we had a patient here in Boston who presented with fever and coma. She couldn't give the history that she'd been on a safari in, in Africa and so people didn't think of malaria. Pulmonary edema can look like heart disease or it can look like a, a community-acquired pneumonia. People can present with renal failure. They can have a picture that looks like acute hepatitis. They can present with diarrhea, watery diarrhea or bloody diarrhea. They can present with a shock-like syndrome. And so all of these, these, these presentations, we wanna think about falciparum malaria and make sure that we look for the diagnosis and uh, get the patient diagnosed on treatment promptly. So in terms of treatment, what treatment should we give this 40-year-old man with, with fever? He has uh, serious and complicated falciparum malaria, high parasitemia, cerebral involvement, and renal insufficiency. So here is a list of the agents that we use to treat falciparum malaria. Um, oral agents um, traditionally included 
chloroquine for persons who have been in those few parts of the world where there is still chloroquine sensitive falciparum malaria, so parts of Central America, um, parts of the Middle East, and everywhere else uh, we have chloroquine resistance. And so in the past, we used the combination of quinine and doxycycline or quinine and clindamycin, particularly for people, uh, for women who are pregnant, or atovaquone proguanol. And more recently, the combination of artemether and lumefantrine, coartem, can be used. For severe falciparum malaria, we use parenteral treatment, and in the past, IV quinidine and either doxycycline or clindamycin were used. Now, the problem with, with that combination is quinidine is no longer produced in the United States and is no longer available. And so the drug of choice for severe and complicated falciparum malaria would be intravenous artesanate um, that we have to get at the moment from CDC. Artesanate recently was approved by the FDA, but it's not yet commercially available. And so for now, until it is on the shelves, um, you need to contact CDC for intravenous artesanate. Um, there's an expanded access uh, ap approach to getting the drug, and it usually can arrive within several hours of request. If the patient is so sick that you need to start treatment immediately, you can start treatment orally or through an, a, a nasogastric tube with an agent such as artemether lumefantrine or one of the other agents that we, that we mentioned. When the artesanate arrives, um, we give it intravenously in the doses as, as listed. Now, artemisinin combination therapy, the artemisinins are the most rapidly active antimalarials that we have. They've, they've been in the use in, for thousands of years in Chinese traditional medicine. Um, they're active against most strains of resistant uh, Plasmodium falciparum, as well as against other species. And in terms of survival benefit, um, improved survival compared with other, other treatments, particularly quinine, which was the treatment of choice before. We always give artemisinin drugs in combination with a second drug. Artemisinin rapidly lowers the parasitemia, but doesn't eliminate it unless the treatment is continued for over a week or so. And so we give a second agent to, to deliver the coup de grace, and that's usually a long acting agent. So either something like mefloquine, atovaquone, proguanol, lumethantrine, and, and others. Now, as has been the case with other antimalarials, unfortunately, there is um, emerging resistance, particularly in Southeast Asia. So we need to watch that closely. But for now, the drugs of choice for treatment of falciparum malaria are, are artemisinin combination drugs. And so for oral therapy, it's the combination of artemether, lumefantrine, or coartem, and for severe and complicated falciparum malaria intravenous artesanate. Now, the other species of malaria, Plasmodium vivax, ovale, and malariae are the so-called benign malarias. They make people sick, but they usually don't kill them, although people can die from, um, from infection with the other species, including, including vivax. The case of vivax and ovale malaria these parasites only infect the very young cells. So you can see the infected cells are large. Um, you can see the more mature forms of the parasite in the peripheral blood. So there's no sticky red cells. There's no adherence to small blood vessels. Death is unusual. But both of these parasites have the ability to relapse. And relapse can occur weeks later or months later, or even several years after initial infection. The way we treat vivax and ovale malaria is usually with chloroquine, although there is chloroquine resistant vivax in some parts of the world, so you need to check it on, on where your patient has come from. And then to prevent further relapses uh, from the dormant forms, the dormant forms of the parasite that stay in the liver, um, we need to deliver a radical cure by giving either primaquine or a drug called tefenaquine. Um, these are drugs that can cause hemolysis in persons who are G6PD deficient, so we need to test for that deficiency before administration. Primaquine is a daily do dose of medication for two weeks, but tofenafin is um, good in a single dose. However, we use tofenafin only after treating with chloroquine, and uh, we don't have a lot of data for how effective it is with ovale. Now, something about prevention of, of malaria in travelers, um, we recommend prophylaxis for person who's gonna be traveling to malaria endemic areas. And so here's a question for you. What prophylaxis would you recommend for a 59 year old who's gonna spend 10 days traveling to Hanoi, Bangkok, and Singapore? This is for a business trip. Your choices are weekly chloroquine, daily doxycycline, weekly mefloquine, daily atovaquone proguanol, or malarone, tofenaquine, or none of the above. So think, think for a second. 
Um, here's um, just a few, few words about malaria chemoprophylaxis. So there are some parts of the world where there is no chloroquine resistance in, in Plasmodium falciparum. So places like the Caribbean, of Central America, you can use weekly chloroquine or weekly, weekly hydroxychloroquine. The rest of the world, there's chloroquine resistance, and so the choices there are daily doxycycline, daily atovaquone proguanol, weekly mefloquine, or tefenoquine. Now, mefloquine we can't use in these border areas in Southeast Asia where there's a high level of mefloquine resistance. And then tefenoquine we'll talk about in a, in a second. Um, keep in mind that none of the drugs other than tefenoquine uh, are going to prevent relapses of Plasmodium vivax or ovale. So this is where tefenoquine, which is a, a new agent for preventing malaria, um, is, has, has some attractive features. It's an analog of, of primaquine. It was approved in the United States a couple years ago. And it's active against all stages of the parasite, not only those in the liver, but also those in the blood. And it's administered in a very simple regimen, um, three days loading dose before travel, um, a, a single dose once a week, and then a single dose after, after, uh, after travel. Um, you do have to check G G6P uh, to make sure people aren't deficient, and uh, it is contraindicated during, during pregnancy. So tefenoquine is, is a, a nice agent for preventing malaria. Now returning to our patient who's going to Hanoi, Bangkok, and Singapore, what do you recommend? Well, the answer is none of the above. And the reason for that is there's no transmission of malaria in any of these three cities. So if the person's gonna stay in the city, uh, chemoprophylaxis is, is not needed. To find this type of information, a great place to look is the CDC malaria map function. And you can either click on the map or you can type in the destination. You'll get the, the lowdown on what the malaria situation is, whether it's a seasonality, and also recommendations for what would be the appropriate chemoprophylaxis. Here's another patient um, who presents with fever after travel. This is a 23-year-old woman. Um, she's back three days after a beach trip in Bahia, Brazil, and she's got fever and rash. She said her symptoms came on abruptly. She had fevers, shaking chills, headache, muscle aches, and joint aches. Her temperature was 102. She had a diffuse erythematous rash, which you can see in the photo, and she had very discreet generalized lymphadenopathy. Her weight count was 3,400. The differential was normal. Her platelets were reduced at 120,000. So what's your differential? Fever, rash after, after tr travel, a couple of days after coming back from Brazil. So kind of think of what, you, what you'd be thinking about. And I'll give you a rundown of a differential diagnosis. I think many of you are probably thinking dengue, um, but at the same time, if we think of dengue, we should think of chikungunya and Zika, but also think of acute HIV, Epstein-Barr virus. They've not been vaccinated, measles, uh, rubella, Parvovirus, plain old enteroviruses, rickettsial infections, um, group A strep, streptococcal toxic shock can present uh, with, with fever and a diffuse rash or scarlet fever, syphilis, typhoid, rose spots, leptospirosis, or if they're taking a new medication, a drug, a drug reaction. So it's a broad differential diagnosis. In this case, our clinical diagnosis was dengue. It sounded like dengue, and uh, we're able to confirm the diagnosis retrospectively with, with serology. We, um, got the serology at a time that both the IgG and the IgM were positive. Um, she had fever for about seven days and then defervesced. And then as is fairly typical in patients with dengue, she had pro prolonged fatigue for several weeks. Now, what we didn't know at the time that we saw her, um, while she was in Brazil, there was a simultaneous outbreak of both Zika and chikungunya as well as dengue. And uh, this is, this is uh, problematic because the vector that transmits all three of these agents uh, um, oftentimes will be, can transmit within the same geographic area. Now, classic dengue, the incubation period is, is um, usually in the range of one to seven days, more often two to three to four days, but can be as long as 14 days. Typically, the illness lasts for five to seven days with fever. Um, fever may be biphasic with a little break in the middle. About half of the people will have a rash. It starts out with a flush and then later turns into your, your, your typical macular or measles-like eruption. The way to diagnose dengue is if you catch them early in the first five to seven days, um, PCR, 
within five days is, is the most sensitive way to make the diagnosis. And then after five days, the antibody test, and CDC suggests just getting the IgM antibody test. One thing that's important to keep in mind is um, complicated dengue that can be life-threatening is more common in people who've been infected once in the past. And so dengue shock syndrome or dengue hemorrhagic fever occurs in people with previous infection. So if you have a patient who's had a history of, of, of dengue, we'll be very careful advising them when they go back to travel that they avoid mosquito bites. Now, chikungunya um, is in some ways very similar in the acute presentation to dengue. Um, in the, the word chikungunya in the, in the language of Mozambique means that which bends up. And that's because there's a high rate of arthralgia and arthritis in patients with chikungunya, both acutely. And then over a third of patients who are infected go on to develop a chronic arthralgia or even a chronic inflammatory arthritis that can, go, can last for years. And this can be extremely problematic. Zika also um, presents like dengue. Um, there may be some joint swelling and, and joint pains, and oftentimes patients will have conjunctivitis. Um, of course, we all have heard about Zika during pregnancy and the fact that the mother who becomes infected during pregnancy can give birth to a child with microcephaly or other, other brain defects. In older populations, there have been neurological consequences of Zika, including Guillain-Barre. And Zika can be transmitted sexually, both from the male to the female and in the other direction. Now, the presentation of dengue, chikungunya, and Zika acutely is, is very difficult to sort out. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's um, unreasonable to make a sure shot diagnosis acutely. You should really think that all three are in the differential if all three are circulating in the area where your travel's been, traveler's been visiting. Um, Patients who have dengue, because of the risk of, of bleeding from low, low platelets, we don't like to use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. So um, until you've diagnosed chick Zika or chikungunya, stay away from the non-steroidals. This is a map showing the, the current distribution of, uh, of, of dengue. This is from CDC. Um, estimated about 100 million clinical cases a year, probably four times as many subclinical cases and 20,000 deaths. Uh, the vectors are Aedes aegypti is the most common vector, but also the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, can transmit the, the virus as, uh, as well. You can see this is widespread distribution through the tropics and subtropics. And if we look at the, the distribution of chikungunya and Zika, um, it's, it's very, very similar. This is a curve looking at the, the number of cases of Zika in the Americas um, starting at the time of the outbreak in 2016 and ongoing. And what we've seen with Zika and to a lesser extent, but also with chikungunya is a, a marked decrease in cases. And so most of the cases such as our patient nowadays are gonna turn out to be dengue. And it's thought that the, 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 the rate of dengue in, um, in most of the world is gonna be 100 or 200 times greater than the, 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 the rate of, uh, of Zika. Um, both the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes are found in the United States. And uh, um, this is the, the range of Aedes aegypti and this is Aedes albopictus here. Um, they've been increasing their range. They've been moving northward in recent years, and we have had cases of transmission of both dengue and uh, Zika in the United States. And so we need to think about that, and particularly um, as our, our local temperatures get warmer and, and warmer. We still concerned about Zika um, and pregnancy, and uh, currently CDC advises against travel uh, to Zika endemic areas uh, for women who are thinking about pregnancy or pregnancy, particularly if there is a recognized ongoing outbreak. And the, the CDC website will actually tell you where in the world there are, are Zika outbreaks. We'll also give recommendations about what um, travelers should think about if they're going to an area where there's a risk of Zika but not known transmission. And then what to do if, uh, if they've been um, exposed, um, how to uh, prevent getting infected if, if uh, it's the partner that's in, involved, an excellent source of information on the CDC website. I'm gonna turn away from fever now and talk a little bit about diarrhea after travel. And this was the case of a 42-year-old man who 
developed diarrhea while he was traveling in Thailand. Um, as luck would have it, he got sick on the plane ride back. He developed abdominal cramps, watery diarrhea, and chills. He had levofloxacin with him to treat diarrhea, and he, he self-treated himself. And after about seven days, uh, he was feeling quite a bit better. Um, stool was still a little bit loose, but everything else had, had uh, resolved, and, and he was feeling pretty well. But about a day or so after stopping the levofloxacin, and his symptoms came back again. He had chills, diarrhea, and crampy abdominal pain. So question for you, um, what do you think is going on? Most likely diagnosis. Is this a treatment failure? Is this amoebic dysentery? Is this C. diff colitis? He's been taking a quinolone, or is this falciparum malaria? And actually, if you think about it, um, any one of these three could fit the bill for 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 a, a diarrheal syndrome in this in this um, in this scenario. Um, but um, in terms of what he had, he had some white cells in his stool. The exam for stool and ovarian parasites was negative, and the assay for Clostridium difficile toxin was negative. A repeat stool culture he had Campylobacter that was resistant to the fluoroquinolones. And so this is how chloro fluoro fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter infections oftentimes present. People get better initially, but then they, they relapse. And so the way we treat them is with azithromycin. So he got better quickly, but subsequently over the next six months, he still had intermittent bouts of loose stool and cramps. And so question now is what do you, what do you think is, is going on? Well, he has persistent traveler's diarrhea, um, which we, we define as diarrhea that lasts greater than two to three weeks. And um, if, if we look at, at people who have infectious diarrhea or people who have traveler's diarrhea, um, it's, it's a surprisingly high percentage of them that have ongoing chronic GI symptoms after the, after the bout. So Herb DuPont, who studied traveler's diarrhea in, in students for years and years, um, detected 10 to 20 percent of, of students who had traveler's diarrhea ended up with some type of chronic GI issue. Now in working up persistent traveler's diarrhea, we think about three major categories of what might be going on. We think of infections, um, we think about chronic gastrointestinal disease that was unmasked by this, this enteric infection. So um, the literature describes it well, and we see a case every year or so, someone who has um, a bout of traveler's diarrhea and doesn't get better, and then turns out to have inflammatory bowel disease, has ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And they, they had the, the predisposition before travel, they got sick, and that unmasked it. And so we think about chronic GI disease unmasked by the acute infection. And then we think about post-infectious processes. As far as the, the infectious causes of persistent traveler's diarrhea, protozoan infections are the most common. So things such as giardia, cryptosporidiosis, um, the close relatives of cryptosporidium, cyclospora, cyst isospora, um, can all cause prolonged diarrhea. And then entamoeba histolytica, which instead of a watery diarrhea would be a bloody diarrhea. Worms are a much less common cause of, of diarrhea, but if you do have worms and diarrhea, the likely agents are either strongyloides or, or schistosomes. Bacteria can do it, so C. diff we had talked about, and then some of the enterodherent E. coli species can do it as well. Tropical sprue is probably bacterial, so I've put this as, as a, a potential infectious cause of persistent diarrhea. Um, we diagnose these infections by microscopy and stool for ovarian parasites and uh, and cultures, but there also are now available multi-pathogen molecular assays where you can, you can test for multiple different agents all at once on a stool specimen. And then finally, we have the post-infectious causes. Um, and so persons who have episodes of acute diarrhea can end up with a lactase deficiency that can cause their diarrhea, or if they've received antibiotics, a bacterial overgrowth syndrome. And so that needs to be thought about and pursued. Um, the most common cause of persistent diarrhea after, after travel is post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. And that, that triggers, the, the acute event triggers this, this uh, irritable bowel syndrome that can last for months and months and months. And that's what we thought our patient had and managed him a, a, accordingly. So obviously, um, we want to keep our travelers free from traveler's diarrhea, both the acute event but also the prolonged consequences that, that might evolve. So uh, preparing travelers, uh, we can educate them. Um, the CDC 
slogan, boil it, cook it, peel it, or forget it. That's a lot easier said than done. People should wash their hands and use hand sanitizer closely. Um, we usually don't use chemoprophylaxis, but if we do, um, bismuth subsalicylate actually can prevent um, a high percentage of bouts of traveler's diarrhea. It has action against bacterial toxins, and most of our traveler's diarrhea are E. coli toxigenic strains. We usually don't use antibiotics, but there may be a particularly high-risk patient or a high-risk high travel um, where we'd want to give a couple of days of an antibiotic, and they are effective in lowering the risk of, of, uh, of infection. There is a traveler diarrhea vaccine available in Europe, not very effective, and we, we don't have it here in the United States. What I, what I tell my patients to do is uh, manage diarrhea um, during travel should it occur. They need to stay well hydrated. If they have diarrhea but no fever and no blood in the stool, so they don't have an invasive process, it's okay to take uh, loperamide, and that can be a real comfort measure. And then um, I usually recommend trying bismuth subsalicylate. Um, a couple of tablets every half hour for several hours can be curative in over half of the cases, again, because most of the cases are toxin-mediated. In severe cases, or in cases in which there's fever and blood, that's where you might use empirical antibiotics. And because of the issues with, with fluoroquinolone resistance, we are usually using azithromycin. This can be a, a single dose or a three-day dose. Um, there was a nice recent paper where a single dose of azithromycin and a single dose of lapiramide cured about 90% of cases of traveler's diarrhea. Um, you can also use um, other agents such as rifaximin and fluoroquinolones, but azithromycin has become the the, the usual antibiotic that we use. It's a double-edged sword, and um, when you take an antibiotic overseas, one, you run the risk of, of side effects, and then two, um, you are setting the stage for becoming colonized with a highly resistant bacterium. And so this was a, a study, one of several similar studies, where travelers' uh, stools are examined pre- and post-travel. And those who went to South Asia, India, and, and, and Nepal, um, who took antibiotics for traveler's diarrhea, when they came back, they had a high rate of colonization with uh, highly resistant uh, extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing bacteria. So something to think about when you're advising your patients. I think it's nice to have the antibiotics, but to, to really um, have a high threshold for using them and just in the most severe cases. I'd like to talk a little bit now about subclinical chronic infections of immigrants and returning long-term expatriates. And, um, certainly with our immigrant population, um, we think about screening for latent tuberculosis, um, if, if relevant, HIV infection, hepatitis B. But what about these other ones on the list? Um, should we be screening patients for Chagas disease, strongyloidiasis, schistosomiasis, or cystosarcosis, all parasitic diseases? So let's go through a couple of cases. So this is a 27-year-old woman um, who had immigrated from rural El Salvador, and she'd gone to donate blood, and then she got a, a letter from the blood bank a couple, a couple of weeks later saying that her blood had tested positive for antibodies to Trypanosoma cruzi, shown here. This is the agent of Chagas disease. She comes to the office. The, the letter says you should seek medical attention. She has no symptoms. Um, her physical examination is normal, and blood work is normal as well. So question I have for you is, um, does she have Chagas disease, and do we need to do further evaluation or treatment for this for this patient? So a little bit about Chagas disease, also known as American trypanosomiasis. Um, in the United States, we estimate that somewhere between 200 and 300,000 people are living um, in the country who are chronically infected with trypanosoma cruzi. And these are largely immigrants, so there is a little bit of transmission in the southern part of the United States. Most of these people have no symptoms, and they don't know that they're infected. Um, we began screening blood in the United States for T. cruzi um, in, in 2007, and since then have picked up about 2,500 people who, who are infected. Um, the blood banks will do a, a confirmatory test, and so if your patient um, went to Red Cross, one of the major blood banks, um, it's pretty worrisome that if, if they received the letter, it's worrisome that it is a positive test. Now, you can confirm that by sending a, a specimen off to CDC for confirmation. Um, in terms of deciding whether you think your patient was at risk or not, um, the typical risk factors are someone who's grown up in Latin America, Mexico, Central America, South America, not the Caribbean. They have a history of living in poor housing. 
So um, such as a mud and stick house here or a, a house with a thatch, thatched roof where the vector, the triatomine bug can, can live. Um, they may have gotten a blood transfusion in Latin America, or maybe there's a history of a mother or sibling who have Chagas disease or some of the symptoms of, of, of Chagas disease. The way we diagnose chronic Chagas disease with serological tests, we need two different tests uh, to, to get the, 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 the best sensitivity, um, either two different platforms or two different antigens. Now, chronic Chagas disease, most people have no signs or symptoms and stay that way for the, the rest of their life, but about 20 or 30 percent of people, several decades after initial infection, uh, will go on to develop either chronic Chagas heart disease or chronic Chagas gastrointestinal disease. This usually occurs in persons who were infected in childhood and then show up with their illness as uh, middle-aged or, or, or older elder adults. Um, they can present with a cardiomyopathy, a dilated cardiomyopathy with congestive failure, with severe arrhythmias, and sudden cardiac death is one of the presentations for chronic Chagas disease. They can have uh, thromboembolic events and strokes. One of the clues to chronic Chagas heart disease is right bundle branch block on the cardiogram. Persons um, who are infected south of the equator, in addition to heart disease, may have gastrointestinal disease, and they can present with megasophagus and trouble swallowing and a ma massively dilated esophagus, or trouble defecating with a megacolon. Persons who are chronically infected with Chagas disease um, who become immunosuppressed, they develop advanced HIV infection or immunosuppressive therapy, um, they can reactivate and have an acute illness with lesions in the brain or acute myocarditis. A chronically infected mother can transmit the infection to the, the fetus, and so congenital Chagas disease is actually a very common issue in, in endemic areas in Latin America. If we diagnose someone with, with Chagas disease, um, we do have parasitic treatment available. Benzonidazole has been approved by the FDA and, and, and can be available by prescription through the company, um, and nifertamox is available through CDC. People who have acute Chagas disease, um, congenital Chagas disease, a reactivative infection in the setting of immunocompromise, they always need to be treated. We should identify young people with Chagas disease and treat them because we have a high rate of cure and hopefully can prevent them from getting into trouble with GI or, or cardiac disease. And then all women of childbearing age should be treated because if we treat them before they become pregnant, we can prevent the transmission of the parasite to the baby. Older persons, we, we consider treatment on an individual basis. We usually don't treat people with advanced heart disease. It's too late, and these drugs have a lot of toxicity. Now, Fertimox, as I mentioned, available through the CDC. Um, this is the supplier of benzonidazole in the United States. You, you go online and can get the drug from them directly. Now, next case of, of a patient with a a chronic asymptomatic infection was uh, that of this 32-year-old man from Ecuador. Um, he presented with renal failure um, related to diabetes and, and hypertension. He'd been living in the United States for eight years, hadn't been back to Ecuador, and was evaluated for kidney transplant. Um, he complained of epigastric pain. They wondered if he had some gastritis. Also on his, his peripheral blood, he had a 9% eosinophilia. He went ahead and got the, the kidney transplant, and about six weeks later, comes back to the hospital with fever, crampy abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea. Um, blood cultures return positive for E. coli, for which he's, he receives broad-spectrum antibiotics. And then over the course of several days, he develops progressive respiratory failure. He ends up dying, um, ultimately, from this, this uh uh, this this progression. So what do you think is going on? What do you think is the, the, the diagnosis? Well, the way the diagnosis was made was on bronchoscopy after he was intubated, and um, the filariform, infective form larvae of Strongyloides strigoralis were encountered. Um, immunosuppression was held. He was given daily ivermectin through an NG tube. Um, he went on to develop E. coli meningitis in addition to his bacteremia, and he ended up dying from this. And on postmortem, Larvae were found throughout the gut, which was largely destroyed, but also in the lungs, the brain, and the heart. So this was disseminated strongyloidiasis, and makes a very good point about chronic strongyloides infection. Strongyloides is an unusual worm in terms of what it can do in the human host. It can complete its life cycle in the host and, and can increase in numbers and reproduce itself without exogenous reinfection. So once infected, 
people remain infected for life. And so our history has to go back to day, day zero. Um, people with chronic infection may not have symptoms. Um, eosinophilia can be a helpful clue, as, as in this case. Um, unfortunately, clue was not recognized. Um, upper GI symptoms that re resemble peptic ulcer disease or mild intermittent loose stools can be, be uh, tip-offs for strongyloidiasis. The big problem with chronic strongyloidiasis is uh, what happens when the, the uh, patient receives immunosuppressive therapy, particularly with corticosteroids, or has HTLV-1 infection, or just becomes severely mal malnourished and, mal and, and immunosuppressed on that basis. In that case, the replication of the parasite can be stepped up. Infection can overwhelm the host, disseminate throughout the body, and without treatment, um, without treatment and oftentimes without, without reversing the immunosuppression, the disseminated infection can be 100% uh, fatal. So the diagnosis of the chronically infected person, and this may be asymptomatic, uh, is to look for the parasite. You can do stool exams, but even more sensitive than stool exam is a serological test. And so um, should immigrants from areas where strongyloides is endemic, which is rural areas throughout the tropics, should they be screened for strongyloides? Yes, they, they should be. If you make the diagnosis while they're still well, um, Ivermectin, either a single dose or a single dose on two days, is highly effective. Next case of a, of a subclinical infection was this 25-year-old woman who presented with seizures. Um, she'd spent a semester in college in Ghana. She knew she wasn't supposed to go in, fr in fresh water, but four years later, she's at work. She has a seizure, has this MR scan. They think she has a, a, a brain tumor and goes to surgery and craniotomy. Um, what are found are eggs and granulomas around the eggs, eggs of Schistosoma mansoni. So she had Schistosomiasis mansoni, and after she woke up from the anesthesia and was told the diagnosis, she remembered one day she and a friend walked barefoot along the side of a river in, in Accra, and that's how she became infected. So um, treated with prosequano, and she, and she fortunately did very well. Schistosomiasis is a helminthic disease, a, a worm infection. Um, that's acquired by contact with fresh water that contains snails that are shedding the larval form of schistosomes. Uh, patients um, who have never had schistosomiasis, this would be our travelers, um, may develop an acute infection syndrome after they're, they're in initially infected. So within weeks after the encounter, they can develop fever, eosinophilia, hives, abdominal pain, and cough. Um, once the disease becomes chronic and, and worms can stay alive for years or decades, um, the problem is due to eggs that are, are deposited by the, the, the worms into blood vessels but can gain access to different tissues. And so they, they get lodged in the bowel and the liver, but also can be spread to unusual destinations like the spinal cord or central nervous system. And there they elicit a, a granulomatous response that, that uh, can cause dramatic sim symptoms. So um, we want to think about schistosomiasis in people who've been exposed to fresh water in endemic areas, and many of them will be asymptomatic, but they, just like this woman, could be at risk for these devastating neurological complications at a later time. We make the diagnosis by finding eggs in the stool of the urine. Um, we uh, can also make the diagnosis with serology, which is much more sensitive. Um, we treat schistosomiasis with, with uh, prosequanol. The final agent that um, may be uh, present in your asymptomatic immigrant is cystocercosis, uh, which is infection with the larval stage of the pork tapeworm, tinea solium. Now, we usually don't screen patients for this, and I'll, I'll tell you why, but the way people become infected with cystocerci is not from ingesting raw pork, which will lead to infection with the, the, the adult pork tapeworm, um, but by ingesting the eggs um, that, that the, adult, the adult tapeworm produces. And so um, whenever we have a case of cystricosis, we want to ask, where did it come from? Because someone's harboring a, a tapeworm, and that's the source of the infection. People with cystocercosis, the larval forms uh, become important if they're present in the central nervous system, in the eye, the brain, or the, the, the spinal cord. Here's a cystocercus. When they degenerate, as you see here, um, there's an inflammatory reaction, and that oftentimes gives rise to, to, to seizures. So seizures are the most important or the most common presenting complication of cystocercosis. Now, the way we diagnose cystocercosis or neurocystocercosis is by imaging, a CT scan or MR. 
And um, if you see that little scolix in the cystic lesion, we've, we've confirmed the diagnosis. There's also serology available through CDC to confirm the diagnosis. We don't screen people because really we'd be screening for neurocystitocosis, and that would mean screening with a CT scan or an MR. Um, persons who have cystocerci, um, we typically treat them with either high doses of albendazole or praziquanil. We look into their eyes to make sure there's not cystocerci in the eyes before treatment because we don't want to cause an inflammatory action in the eye that would require surgery. Um, we give them steroids and any convulsants um, in case they get an inflammatory reaction to the degenerating cystocercus with treatment. And in some cases, we have to do surgery or put shunts in if there's a block of CSF. You always want to search for the tapeworm carrier in the, in the household and treat that person. And finally, just to finish up, I want to present a few cases of skin lesions in returning travelers. First, this was a, a teenager who presented with an itchy rash, and he and his family had gone to 10 days for a beach vacation in Trinidad. He came back with this itchy rash that was getting worse, went to the doctor, got a course of amoxicillin, and didn't get better. Here's his rash, um, this serpiginous kind of blistering rash, very itchy. Um, it's an eyeball diagnosis. Um, what do you think it is? And what it is is cutaneous larva migraines, or also known as the creeping eruption. And what it is is infection with dog or cat hookworms. The infective larva is found in soil. It's typically um, sandy, sandy soil um, contaminated with feces of either dogs or cats. Um, the parasite gets into the skin and then doesn't, doesn't progress any further, gets stuck in the skin and then migrates and migrates for days or weeks and elicits this, this very itchy, itchy rash. The diagnosis is clinical. It's an eyeball diagnosis and the treatment is easy, um, either with uh, oral ivermectin or oral albendazole. The uh, geo Sentinel Network has collected data on skin lesions and returning travelers, and cutaneous larva migraines was, was present in a quarter of their cases who came back with, with, with rashes. Other common causes were bacterial infections, paroderma, um, insect bites, myiasis, tungiasis. Um, some people had hives, some people had fever and rash like we had talked about, some people had cutaneous leishmaniasis. And so these are not totally obscure diagnoses. Here's our next case. Uh, this was a 47-year-old man, previously healthy, who comes in with skin lesions after travel in West Africa. He had gone to a conference. Um, he stayed in a five-star hotel in Togo. Um, he was a road chicken. Um, he rarely ventured out of the hotel. He only ate hotel food, slept in an air-conditioned room with the windows closed. Once or twice he was brave, he went walking on the beach outside the hotel, um, he went swimming in the chlorinated hotel pool and he lounged on the wooden cots near the pool. No history of insect bites during the trip, but um, he did have the sensation of bites and little red bumps that he noticed on his buttocks and thighs um, just, just after he, he left. Actually on the flight back, he had a couple of stops on the way back and it was, was leaving India where he started to notice these boils on his skin and they grew in size, um, a couple of centimeters in diameter and they were uncomfortable. He was not able to sit down. And uh, he got off the plane, came right in the emergency room and he said, these things are getting bigger in front of my eyes. And he said, I can feel things moving inside. And um, when, I, when I put them underwater, I see bubbles coming out. Anybody know the diagnosis here? Multiple boss, he had 50 of these lesions. Well, he had myiasis, furuncular myiasis, which is infestation with fly maggots or fly larvae. Um, in Africa, this is due to the tumbu fly, cordylobia. And the, the cycle is interesting. The eggs are deposited on sandy, um, sandy soil or clothes contaminated with urine or sweat. The, the heat from the, the person's body causes the eggs to hatch. The little larvae get out, they get into the skin, and then they grow um, in the subcutaneous tissue of these larvae that can be a centimeter or so in, in length. Um, the, the tissue around it becomes inflamed and it looks like a boil, hence furuncular myiasis. And about a couple weeks later, um, this, this larva will mature, will fall out of the skin, pupate, and then eventually turns into a fly. So this is the tumbu fly. This is supposedly why they iron clothes in uh, your, your underwear in Africa, so you don't get tumbu fly myiasis. In this hemisphere, it's usually a single lesion from the human bot fly. Um, people uh, acquire these in, in parts of Central and South America. Treatment is just you get rid of the, you, 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 you pop out the, uh, the, the larvae 
Cordylobia anthropia pops out very easily just by squeezing, but in some cases you need to try and suffocate the larva, putting, blocking the breathing hole with some Vaseline where you need to, to cut it out. This poor guy, he had 50 of them, and uh, um, he was, was just totally out of his mind with what was going on, and especially once he knew the diagnosis, he, he totally flipped out, and he required long-term psychiatric treatment after this, uh, this, this happening. And our last case is that of a 60-year-old biologist um, working on, on, on invertebrates and invertebrates in, in various tropical countries. Um, he was in Peru and he developed these painless ulcers um, afterwards. And the question is, what do you think this is? Painless punched out uh, ulcer. Well, it turns out this, this was cutaneous leishmaniasis and he was bitten by sand flies. And the species that he was infected with was Leishmania brasiliensis. And just point this out, um, it's important to make this diagnosis and treat, and treat aggressively because if you don't, there's a risk of developing mucosal leishmaniasis, which can be extremely hard to, uh, to treat. The cutaneous leishmaniasis you treat by biopsy or smears and cultures of scrapings or aspirates. Um, you can send specimens off to CDC. And the treatment, um, there's a variety of different agents that we can use. We can treat parenterally with amphotericin. We can get old-fashioned antimony or miltepazine. Um, I, I kind of like to talk about this particular patient, the, the, the person who belonged to, to this lesion. Um, he was a herpetologist, worked on snakes and worked all over the world. And uh, in addition to leishmaniasis, um, he had been treated inadequately 10 years earlier for his cutaneous lesions. Um, he had had dengue, he had malaria, um, he had typhoid. He had all sorts of issues during travel, and I, I wondered what was the what was the worst thing that you ever had in all your travels. And he said, um, dengue. He said it was even worse um, than when he was struck by lightning. And he'd been been working in Madagascar, got struck by lightning, and was paralyzed for several hours, worried that his friends might might think he was dead and bury him him alive. So dengue is really 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 nasty. So that's what I wanted to cover. Um, think about travel-related infections when you formulate your differential diagnoses. Um, don't miss falciparum malaria. It can be rapidly fatal, and you want to rule it out in all febrile patients coming back from malaria endemic areas, regardless of the presentation. Um, what we see in immigrants and short-term travelers is oftentimes different. And so uh, um, the, the, some of the very important infections of immigrants are these subclinical ones that we, we talked about. And most travel associated infections diseases can be prevented by asking about travel plans when your patients come to the clinic and providing advice, vaccines, and prophylactic medication. Just end up two quick questions for you. Young man returns from Haiti with fever, headache, temperature 103, he looks well. Laboratory studies show mild anemia, low platelets, normal renal function. Blood smear shows a few rings of plasmodium falciparum. What should we treat him with? So here's, here's a person, fever, um, otherwise looking well, falciparum. Uh, treatment of choice is artemether lumefantrine. Artemisinin combination therapy is the treatment of choice for all cases of falciparum malaria because of more rapid action and increased survival compared to other agents. And then failure to treat which of the following um, can lead to death from overwhelming infection in a person who's getting high doses of corticosteroids. Falciparum malaria, Babesia, giardiasis, strongyloidiasis, or schistosomiasis? Well, the answer is strongyloidiasis. And remember the, the disseminated hyperinfection um, that we see in patients um, receiving corticosteroids. Um, risk factors for really severe babesiosis and malaria are splenectomy, um, giardiasis, usually, giardiasis is usually not going to be fatal, um, but there are uh, some immunodeficiencies in which uh, people with giardia can get very sick. Um, corticosteroids don't seem to have an adverse effect on, on schistosomiasis. So thank you very much for your, your attention. Here's a few references for further reading if you're interested. Thanks.